Okay, hi everyone. Can can you see my screen? Yes. And Excellent. You. Okay, cool. All right. Well, good afternoon, and and thanks for coming, and and also thanks for sticking around. Um, we've heard quite a bit today already about the things that GSQ and our collaborators are. Um, doing to explore avenues to develop our critical minerals industry across the state. Um, in my opinion, one of the most interesting aspects of this broader challenge is, is finding and effectively accessing previously unrecognised wealth in existing commodities. So this, of course, adds value, but it also reduces waste. And along those lines today, I'll present a GSQ project which aims to explore the additional value uh, that rare earth elements and yttrium can add to phosphate-rich sediments called phosphorites that are already a valuable phosphorus resource unto themselves, specifically phosphorites in the eastern margin of the Georgina Basin uh, in, in Queensland. Uh, before I start, though, I'd, I'd like to thank my colleague, Michaela, and sorry about the pronunciation, but Grigorescu. Um, we've been working together on this project since I started at GSQ, and, and uh, prior to that, Michaela actually got started on this project before I arrived. So today I'll, um, I'll introduce uh, briefly what a phosphorite is, uh, and then I'll try and impart on you why we care about them from a critical minerals perspective. Uh, and then I'll step out and, and just introduce uh, where they are in context of the eastern margin of the Georgina Basin, both their extent along the, the margin, but also their position within the stratigraphy. Uh, then I'll go into a little bit of detail surrounding the rare earth element and yttrium uh, incorporation into phosphorites, uh, which will lead us to the project outline and then I'll finish with a discussion um, around some of the preliminary results, um, how the Georgina Basin phosphorites stack up against other phosphorites in terms of rare earth element endowment uh, and how they stack up against other rare earth element deposit types uh, in Australia. So phosphorites, hold on a second, I'm just going to use my laser pointer. Okay, maybe I won't. Um, so phosphorites are um, marine sedimentary rocks containing in excess of of 30% uh, phosphate. Uh, by definition, they contain more than 50% phosphate minerals by volume. Uh, so these things are, are well endowed in phosphorus and they're a, they're a uh, resource type unto themselves, as I said before, and they're currently the world's primary source of phosphorus for fertilizer. Uh, but um, pertinent to this talk, uh, we care about phosphorites because they potentially contain rare earth elements and yttrium. Uh, rare earth elements in phosphorites have been recognized in these rocks for decades, um, but historically have been considered in terms of understanding sedimentary and diagenetic processes. There hasn't been too much of a focus on these uh, previously as a re from a resource perspective, actually very little. But to demonstrate the potential significance of these deposits, um, uh, I've, got the, I've got a plot here which shows the uh, light rare earth elements uh, along the x-axis uh, plotted up against the heavy rare earth elements plus yttrium. Um, there are a number of, of uh, rare earth element deposit types displayed here, some of which we've actually heard about today. So in red, we've got these highly weathered granitic rocks um, that are mined, that the clays from which are mined for rare earth elements in China currently. Um, we've also got uh, peralkaline volcanic rocks from, from two locations. The darker green is the uh, Clary's Dome, which we heard about from Ross. Uh, and then there's another, another deposit in New South Wales called Tungi, which is on there as well. Uh, the yellow are carbonatites. Um, we just heard a great talk about those from Michael. These are actually a data set from, from a uh, colleague of ours, uh, Louise, that did her honours on this. So this is the data set from that. So, um, but most importantly, obviously, we've got the blue here, and this is the Georgina Basin phosphorites. These are actually the preliminary results from, from this current study that we started at the start of the year, actually. So I'd, I'd just like to draw your attention to a couple of things. So the, the first thing is that in terms of light rare earth element abundance, the, um, the phosphorites actually stack up, stack up pretty well against, certainly against the, the peralkaline volcanics, not so much against the, the Nolans bore type, but that is uh, enriched in light rare earths, mind you. Uh, but more importantly to this study is, is actually how significantly they are enriched uh, in, in uh, heavy rare earths. Uh, and this is important because the heavy rares are typically rarer and some of these in particular, as we've heard from Michael already, and I'll touch on briefly, are typically uh, quite expensive. Um, and given their use in renewable technologies, they're, they're highly anticipated to, to increase in price dramatically in the coming years. But I, like, I'll, I'll come back to that. So for the moment, let's just, let's just have a bit of a look at, at these things. So, so this is a map of the, of the eastern margin of the Georgina Basin. Uh, it's an intracritonic rift basin, 
and it largely sits within the it largely sits within the Northern Territory for my for my Northern Territory colleagues that might be listening. Uh, but we'll we'll focus simply on on this margin here that sits within sits within Queensland. Um, uh, the basement in this area is divided into the Undilla um, and Oban subbasins, as well as the Burkery, the structural belt down here to the southeast. Um, and the eastern margin here is defined by, like I said, by the hashing, but you can also see probably perhaps a little bit more uh, intuitively the, the depth to basement map here, where you can see it, it, it getting deeper off to the west, going into the basin, and you can see it essentially a, a shoreline of, of, of basement here. And this sort of defines the easternmost extent of, of the basin. Um, the, the, the sediments in this area are all Cambrian aged. Uh, they result from several marine transgressions during this time, sort of mostly in the mid, middle, middle Cambrian. And all the red dots show the phosphoride occurrence as it sit within those Cambrian sediments. And as you can see, they're, they're right on the very extent, the eastern extent, or right on the margin of the, uh, of the, of the basement, of the, uh, the basin. This isn't all of the known phosphoride occurrences. These, these are the ones that we're potentially going to aim to, to uh, analyze if we haven't already. Um, but it also just gives you a good indication of how they're spread uh, across the entire length of the basin. So the phosphorites are largely hosted in middle Cambrian marine sediments, as I said before, um, uh, specifically in the Beetle Creek formation and the equivalent uh, border waterhole formation, which you can see here in this, in this strap column. Um, these sediments comprise calcareous and uh, siliceous mudstones and siltstones, uh, a few cherts, and the phosphorites. But there's also phosphoric, sil uh, phosphoric, uh, phosphatic, sorry, siltstones uh, and limestones. In the south, the phosphorites are actually discreetly uh, delineated in their own uh, member, the Monastery Creek uh, member. These sediments sit unconformably over Meso Mesoproterozoic Basin, which you, uh, basement, which you can see here, and that's actually the Mount Isa in the in the, in the uh, east. Uh, and they over they actually overlie older sediments to the to the west uh, part of a, a much older super basin that's in the area. Uh, I should also say that these things outcrop and subcrop. So so in some cases they they've been exposed for a long time and they're highly weathered. And in some cases they are still buried under sediment, um, and they and they can be a bit fresher. Historically, these occurrences have been grouped into into three domains, as you can see. Uh, here from north to south. Uh, this is based on differences in the depositional environments of these sediments, which, which comes back to these sort of sub-basinal structures. Uh, factors such as the architecture in the areas and the extent of the marine transgressions throughout the time uh, dictated the size and shape of shelf, in, shelf environments, the depositional environments, uh, the development of a carbonate platform or not, um, the, the depth and energy of the depositional environments all influenced uh, differences across these domains. These differences are reflected in, uh, in corresponding variations in the mineralogy, chemistry, and the phosphate morphology. So, for example, you can see this really fine-grained uh, fossiliferous mudstone, which is down in the south, and you can actually see uh, small brachiopods there, if you're lucky, uh, versus this coarser-grained colloidal phosphorite that exists uh, further to the north. Uh, I'd like to thank Michelle Maseka for these photos, by the way. She's a bit of a guru on this stuff. So people have been working to understand phosphogenesis, the, the formation of these rocks for the best part of 50 years. And we really still don't have a complete picture of how they form. So it's a, it's a complex uh, combination of processes that, that involve the initial sedimentation through to di diagenesis. But with so much left to understand about the formation of the phosphorites, we're really only skimming the surface to understand how the rare earth elements and interim incorporate themselves into these rocks. But we'll, we'll, we'll have a quick look. So, so typically it's understood that the rare earth element budget is taken up mostly in, as a substitution into the main phosphorus bearing mineral, which is a uh, carbonate fluorapatite called francolite or termed francolite. Um, the rare earth elements actually substitute for, for calcium in the, in the structure. Um, and this is thought to occur during uh, the early stages of diagenesis. Um, but one thing we also have to be mindful of uh, are, are secondary rare earth element bearing minerals uh, in phosphorites. And, and this, this may be pertinent to those that have undergone uh, alteration or weathering. So these, these, these are often secondary minerals such as crandallite, which is a uh, clay mineral, or, or xenotime, which contains a significant number of, of, of heavy rare earths and, uh, and yttrium. So as you may expect, uh, not all the phosphorites are the same in terms of rare earth element endowment. Um, here we have a, a, um, 
some literature values for earth elements and phosphorites from different locations and, and geological intervals through time. In this case, the rare earth element concentrations are displayed as, as normalized values to a, to a, uh, a known value. Uh, I've used the post Archean uh, Australian shale, which is, which is different from the chondrite normalized stuff we saw from Michael, but often more often used in, in sedimentary uh, work. And so this, this can roughly be an approximation for, for uh, sedimentary crust or, or, or background values. So anything above one is enriched, anything below one is depleted. Um, so once again, these are, these are actually logar logarithmic scale and, and you can actually see from a few locations around the world here, listed down here, that there's actually several orders of magnitude difference in the rare earth element abundances uh, for different phosphorites. Um, a USGS study looked at American phosphorites particular, particularly, but also looked at other ones around the world with, but with a strong focus on America. And, and they were of the opinion, this was in 2015, this is these guys here, and M's boat. And they were of the opinion that the that rare earth element concentrations appear to be quite discrete um, and consistent through individual phosphorite horizons, but generally change over time quite dramatically. Um, so although they're laterally con con continuous of a given scale, they might vary a lot through the stratigraphy. Uh, and this is demonstrated here where we've got the, um, this sort of light green Cretaceous uh, phosphorite from um, the Midwest in America versus, versus this um, Permian Ameri uh, one from New York State. And so, as you can see, not only do the total concentrations change, but the various proportions of the different phosphorite, uh, different uh, rare earth elements change as well. So, so like the formation of the gen like the genesis of the phosphorites themselves, we, we don't actually understand the exact nature um, of the processes that dictate the rare earth element endowment, but it's likely going to be a combination of all the processes that form the rock. So the depositional environment will play a part. So the USGS study I mentioned linked the changes in seawater chemistry over time to the, uh, to the rare earth element endowment of these rocks. Um, but it's also likely that localised um, uh, sedimentary features such as, such as the, the, um, the, the energy of the environment, the rate of sedimentation and, and the depth will also influence these things. But we also have to consider the uh, diagenesis as well because other studies have shown that the recrystallization of, of francolite readily occurs um, in interaction with uh, groundwaters during, during diagenesis and it will influence the rare earth element budget. And that could be to, to eliminate the rare earths but also to enrich. So we have to be mindful of that. And finally, and I think what's, what's potentially very important to Australia, which is a, you know, a highly weathered, weathered continent, is perhaps the processes that involve the mobilization of rare earth elements during extensive weathering or alteration. And this is, as I've touched on already, the secondary minerals such as inner time or, or clays. So with all that in mind, um, you're probably ready to find out what we're actually doing. Um, and so we're, it's a pretty straightforward approach that we're going with. And we essentially want to understand um, how much rare earth elements there are in Georgina Basin phosphorites and if this varies across the basin. Uh, an extension of this will be to, to pinpoint some specific geological constraints on these rare earth element distributions. Uh, for example, is it simply the, the Cambrian seawater that defines the rare earth element endowment of the Georgina Basin phosphorites, uh, or are there other processes at play? If we can begin to understand some of these processes, we can therefore narrow down places where explorers may want to uh, look to pursue, these, to pursue these deposits. The secondary aim is to explore the, the rare earth element and yttrium endowment of the phosphogypsum and tailings, which is the byproduct of ammonium phosphate production. So our approach is, is equally quite straightforward and simple. Uh, we're going to target known phosphorite accumulations. Uh, we're going to seek samples that provide coverage across the entire um, basin here from, from, from all three domains. So, so some lateral coverage, but also the um, vertical profiles to, to make sure we understand how these things vary through the stratigraphy as well. We're going to sample as many as uh, occurrences as, as we can get our hands on. Um, and as I've showed already, we've actually begun to, to do that. Um, we're undertaking a, a quite a comprehensive geochemical analysis, a uh, whole rocket analytical campaign. Uh, so it's uh, in excess of 40 uh, major and trace elements. And, and we're focusing on diamond drill core where we can get at RC chips and pulps. So that way we can target the intervals and the above and below lithologies um, in, these, in these sequences. So where we can, we'll also focus down to, to local scale structures and processes to try and understand localised upgrading uh, of, these, of these deposits. So, so far, it's, it's, actually, it's actually been really promising to see some results. Um, 
uh, and good results, I should say. Um, so we've identified areas with absolutely significant, like stunning rare earth element nutrient enrichment. Um, and as I touched on before, there's a, there's a really high proportion of the high rare earth elements uh, in the phosphorites we've measured so far. Um, the, the shapes and, and the behaviours aren't unexpected for what we see for other phosphorites around the world, but on this rare earth element normalised plot, again, you can see the, the global phosphorite curves that I've put placed up there. Um, I've just minimised them to highlight this. This is the sort of the extent and distribution of the uh, phosphorites from Georgina Basin that we've measured so far. And uh, we also see a huge variation, as you can see here. It's a, a couple of orders of magnitude variation in the total concentration of these, of the of all rare earths. Um, and and this is actually a very important observation, um, and, a, and especially if we can link it to a geological process, because this will help us really focus down to certain points in the basin that are more prospective than others. So, put it, this is a this is a, a looking at it another way. So, if we return to the to the Parapalline volcanics, these are from Tungi, New South Wales, thanks to Spandler uh, and Morris, 2016, and carbonatites. Um, and so what we've got here are, once again, normalised rare earth element plots. And I've just got a uh, 100 times enriched tide line here. And the extent of the rare earth element abundances across various analyses, I've just sort of made a polygon to show them. And as you can see, the um, rare earth elements in the phosphorites are actually quite impressive. Um, and I've highlighted here terbium dysprosium, some of the more expensive rare earths, of which, of which there are quite a significant enrichment in the, in the phosphorites but also as Michael touched on the battery and magnet, um, the magnet, sorry, uh, elements, praseodymium and neodymium. So these are expected to go up in price by 50% in, in the coming years and, and demand's expected to skyrocket by the hundreds of percent in, in the coming years. So, so we've got, a, we've got a, a very competitive and comparable amount of these versus other rare earth element deposits and certainly excess of these two. So on that note, I'll finish up. Um, uh, so some conclusions, uh, the, initial the initial results are very promising. So if you are an explorer and you're, you're drilling a hole and trying to get to basement as quick as possible, if you happen to uh, intercept some grey white stuff amongst cherts and siltstones, then you might want to send it away for an analysis or at least run a PXRF over it because we're seeing some, some really exciting enrichment here of both the rare earths and, and the yttrium. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of the endowment on the deposit scale, one of the things that I haven't really touched on yet because it's still early days, but will be very important, and Michael actually mentioned it too, is the mineralogy. Uh, this is going to be very important in, in a couple of ways. Firstly, because of the metallurgical implications of extraction, but also understanding these small differences, uh, small modal abundance difference of certain minerals could really change the, the rare earth element budget of these rocks. So by the time I present on this again, hopefully I'll be able to shed some light on some of those things. Uh, so yeah, thanks for listening. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, I'm not holding up a scorecard. Now, um, <laughs> Alison has a question for you. She says, great talk, Matt. Phosphates are also known for containing uranium in some places. Are you checking this too? Because the uranium concentration might affect the economic and environmental viability of rare earth recovery. Uh, yeah, absolutely, we are, we are checking them. Um, my background is is hard rock, and they they don't seem particularly troubling to me. Though the the concentrations that we're seeing so far, uh, we're also we're checking for all of the um, the the uranium and thorium, and, and so far nothing that nothing that makes me stop and think too much about it. But uh, I think we'll have to I think we'll have to look at the rest of the data set that we're currently collecting before we can really make a judgment on that, and, and also if it if it varies. As I said to you as well, the um, there's a lot of weathering going on here. So we're, we are seeing, we are seeing mobilization of elements during weathering. So that's something that we're going to have to consider as well, because there may be a, a significant enrichment of these radionuclides at some, at some horizon that we haven't yet encountered. So it's certainly something we'll keep an eye on for. Awesome. Thanks, Matt.